welcome to our 16th annual Scusa Can Forum for those who did not join us yesterday. Our sessions yesterday exemplified the best examples of thought leadership conversations at a critically challenging time. In three sessions yesterday, we enjoyed stimulating thinking about topics of crucial importance at this moment of time, which is the post-pandemic environment. Our opening session today is entitled In-Demand Jobs for the Future. This is gonna be a roundtable conversation with industry partners that Scusa Can has been working with on career pathway options. The focus is gonna be on trends for jobs that are currently in demand with high growth projections that students can aspire to and realize. Our moderator is Julian Cohn, who held senior positions at the New York City Department of Education and was instrumental in the development of the PTAC model. His career has been dedicated to building career pathways for students, and he helps us accomplish this at schools that can. Julian, thank you for leading today's conversation. And to this distinguished panel of career pathway practitioners, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me to lead this panel. I'm very excited this morning to learn from a really great group of people who are going to share their thoughts on in-demand jobs for the future. I do want to invite our audience who is here today to uh, introduce yourselves in the chat, say who you are, what organi organization you represent. I'm going to try to monitor the chat and include your questions as we go through the morning. So please say hi and know that, that this is a forum for all of us, not just the participants, to share some ideas and thoughts and thinking about a topic that's really on everyone's mind. If, if you're an educator, about what are the changes that are happening in the workplace and how are we going to prepare our students for in-demand jobs of the future. As I was thinking about this, um, <clears throat> about this, pa this panel today, I started to take a look at the World Economic Forum and look at the, the, their predictions of jobs that are increasing between 2020 and 2025. And I saw a lot of digitally enabled jobs around data and digital marketing and process automation, uh, information security, which didn't surprise me. I also looked at the US Department of Labor's predictions of the fastest growing jobs this decade and saw some jobs around solar photovoltaic installer and wind turbine service technician that I didn't really understand what they were, but I'm, I'm curious to learn from the experts who are here today. Um, and so, you know, the one thing I took away from this is that all of the jobs that we're going to have in the future that are well-paying jobs that are going to lead to economic mobility are going to be broadly in the field of STEM. They're going to involve our students understanding science, technology, engineering, math, but not just understanding, but applying them into, into the real world. And so today's panel will help us think about what the skills are that young people are going to need to succeed in the jobs that we predict in the future. So uh, we're going to focus on four in-demand STEM career paths today, uh, cybersecurity, climate action, advanced manufacturing, architecture and design. And we have people here who are, um, who are dedicated to, to, to this, this path and practitioners on the path. I am going to ask our uh, practitioners to uh, introduce themselves, um, their organization, and tell us why your sector is a high growth, high demand sector in the economy. And I'm gonna start with, um, with you, Sarah, from Solo One. Morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Pigeon. I am the co-director of programs for a nonprofit organization called Solar One. We work in New York City and in New Jersey. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. So Solar One, we're a nonprofit. Like I said, we do solar technical assistance. We have a K through 12 education program that includes current technical education. And we have a large workforce training program for un and underemployed adults here in New York City. Um, so I think one of the big reasons that the green and climate action focused careers are going to be such a massive economic growth area and opportunity for jobs in the near future 
is because of the climate crisis. It's one of the most significant threats to human life on earth as we know it. And we have no choice but to address it. And that means a massive transition in how we live our lives. And that includes transitioning away from fossil fuels, increasing wind and solar photovoltaics, like you mentioned, but also improving energy efficiency, switching to electric vehicles, all of these little things, it's really, it's actually part of, it touches every sector. Um, so I think, yes, it's going to be a big area of growth and also a great area for amazing career pathways for our students. Great. Well, we look forward to exploring those as we go through. But let me turn to you now, Mark, um, and ask you to introduce yourself, your, your company, and your sector. Thanks, Julian. Good morning, everybody out there. Uh, my name is Mark Thaler. I'm a partner at Gensler. We're the, the world's largest design organizations with uh, over 50 offices and, and close to 7,000 uh, talented people working uh, to really change the world through the power of design. And and I want to echo uh, what Sarah was saying. Our why I think that our jobs are going to be more in demand is that the climate crisis has really forced a reckoning. You know, buildings are responsible for forty percent of greenhouse gases, and so if we can change the way we think about the built environment, from operational carbon to embodied carbon, um, we will be able to make a huge impact. And so we are constantly looking for different skills um, around climate action, around digital skills. Um, th the profession of architecture is, is undergoing a dramatic shift. And so we're anxious to create new types of positions for students who uh, are looking for not just a design position, but also who are aspiring to also contribute to uh, reducing climate change. Fantastic. We'll make those connections deeper into this panel. But let me turn now to Michelle and ask you to introduce your, your sector. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Julian. Um, my name is Michelle Conklin, and I'm the executive director of BOTS IQ. It's a program of the Pittsburgh Chapter National Tooling and Machining Association. So we are based in the Pittsburgh region, um, but we have connections all across the United States. Um, we focus on providing opportunities for students to experience and explore careers in manufacturing. And uh, a big part of that, as, as everyone knows, manufacturing is a very rich industry and helps build the United States. Um, but currently there are over 17.6 million jobs in the US that come from that sector. Um, and this could include the technical hands-on roles, the administrative roles, um, and even the executive ones. But um, the estimates haven't changed over the last, I've been in this for six years, it hasn't, it hasn't changed at all, sadly. Um, but they estimate that by 2030, there will be about four and a half million job openings that will need to be filled. Um, a significant amount of that is due to retirement of the, the baby boomer population. Um, but another two million of those is due to just new jobs and new markets and new, new needs here in the United States. Um, and what the, the experts are estimating is that about 2.1 million of those jobs are going to go unfilled. Um, a lot of it has to do with misconceptions about the industry. Um, some of it has to do with a lack of skills. But the biggest part and why I'm excited to be here today is just the lack of awareness about what those careers are and what those opportunities are for our students and for our future. So um, thank you, Julianne. I'm excited to, to talk about this today. Yeah, it's mind blowing how, how transformational manufacturing has been and will be. And in the spirit of, of transformational, uh, Quitem, you're, you're up in terms of talking about the fundamental transformations out here. No, thanks. Thanks, Julian. First, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to talk about uh, the work we do at Alpha Secure and more generally the problem at hand. So really excited to be on this panel with uh, these wonderful speakers. Um, my name is Preetam Dutta. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alpha Secure. My background is highly technical, but today I work in a space that marries a very technical world with the world that is coming into a technical age, which is insurance. So Alpha Secure is a cybersecurity insurance company. We build proprietary technology software while delivering cybersecurity insurance, which is the fastest growing area of insurance. I always like to say insurance is this really big area that nobody talks about or thinks about, 
Um, we only think about it when we've got to pay our premiums at the end of the day, um, but it's 3% of the GDP. And cyber insurance makes up uh, the fastest growing segment within all of insurance today. So it's an industry that's here today, getting bigger tomorrow and cybersecurity software in general, right? I think everyone knows that you turn your computer on, you've got a cyber risk. Uh, just yesterday, my uh, bank account almost got hacked. So it, it happens to everyone. Uh, and it's just something that w is part of the digital life that we're uh, getting used to today. Great, and we're, we're gonna tap into your expertise generally around technological skills that underpin so many of the jobs in all of these sectors and others. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna focus now on the issue of hand, which is, which is careers and career pathways, given that all of these are high growth sectors with lots of job opportunities coming on the line. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you in your sector what you see as the career pathway uh, opportunities from entry level to growth. Um, try to drill down a little bit. And also, you know, thinking about the, our audience here who are educators, maybe middle school educators, um, they're thinking about their students who are not entering the workforce for potentially another eight to 10 years. And so if I could also ask you, as you talk about your, you know, the entry level jobs and the pathways to give us some insight into your predictions as to what are those jobs going to be in eight years time when our students are going to be entering the workforce. And I'll go in reverse order and start with you, Preetam, just, uh, you know, because di digital jobs are going to underpin all of this. What, what's the future here? Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak more generally about cyber insurance first, and then I'll talk about cybersecurity uh, next but in general the space has infinite opportunity you can be as technical as you want to be such as myself i have a phd in computer science uh undergrad degree in math and chemical engineering so i'm a highly technical person in the cyber insurance and cybersecurity industry the other spectrum of that is people who are very good with people skills and can really communicate complex ideas in easily digestible format. So they like to talk about technical things, but don't necessarily want to be sitting behind a computer all the time. So that's there's a very wide chasm, I'd say, in this space. So I think you, when you look out eight to 10 years, you have this really unique spectrum of opportunities that's going to exist. You could be highly technical, cyber insurance, cyber security. It's gonna require technical folks there's always a career there. And then on the other side of it, there's the people aspect, right? When a cyber incident takes place and your business is going down, you need someone who you can call and actually feel comfortable speaking to, that job's not going away either. There's always gonna be the people element. I know people like to believe that we're gonna automate and robots are gonna lead the way and just automate jobs away from folks, but that's never gonna happen in insurance. You need that human element to make you feel comfortable. And so there's a whole host of jobs in this space. And I think, um, I think there's an opportunity for everyone in five to 10 or 20 years from now. Preetam, give us an example of a really cool job that you think doesn't exist yet, but is going to be in demand in, in eight years time. So uh, I'll tell you about a job that I think is not in the cyber insurance space today, or isn't as prominently spoken about there. It is there to an extent is the incident response leaders. And so incident response, when a cyber event takes place, you need someone who gets on the phone and tells you what's happening and what's going wrong. And cyber response does happen today, but in the insurance industry, it's abstracted away from folks. I think that position is gonna come more to the front end where the actual incident's gonna take place, the technical individual is going to speak to the end insured. And what's going to happen is you're gonna see a marriage of technical skills and people skills come to work. And that's today is getting abstracted away. But as technical challenges and hacks and everything are getting more complicated, you need someone with that nice combination of technical and people skills to lead the charge. And I think that's a really interesting profession because that's a category that isn't as big today and will be much more prominent in the coming years. Great, all right. Um, Michelle, let's turn to you with, with manufacturing. You talked about, you know, this, this, this is just going to grow and there's going to be a shortage of jobs. So tell us about the pathways and the jobs that are going to become available. Yeah, so I often liken um, career pathways and manufacturing to sort of like a bowl of spaghetti where it just kind of is all over the place. There really is every opportunity available. 
Um, the most common entry level jobs tend to be hands on um, things like an assembler or quality control specialist or a machinist or CNC operator or even a robotic technician these days. Um, those all tend to be um, that hands on technical person um, with a varying degree of, of skill and knowledge needed but one thing that manufacturing has historically done and still continues to do and, and uh, do a lot and do well is that on the job training and apprenticeship model um, for helping individuals who have that desire um, and drive to want to move through um, and up in their career, um, they, they provide a lot of that, that pathway for them. So somebody who could come in as an assembler um, you know, think about the students in your classrooms who really um, are driven towards hands-on activities, um, the Lego builders, the, the robotic kids, um, those kids who really do well there, and, but maybe college isn't the right first step for them after high school. Being an assembler um, is, some, is, a, is a great entry-level position that gets them into a manufacturing facility with little to no experience needed, um, but will have a lot of on-the-job training and um, gear them towards the potential for an apprenticeship. So if they wanted to move into a machining role or an operator role, those opportunities would exist. Um, if they wanted to get more technical, um, either as a robotic technician or a mechatronics um, technician or industrial maintenance technician, there's those opportunities. But a lot of that, that opportunity is, first of all, driven by the student or the, the employee, um, but a lot of it's done in-house. So they don't have to, um, spend time outside of their workday gaining those skills. Um, there certainly is the opportunities for community colleges and short-term training locations to get the skills, um, but manufacturers want to um, invest in their employees and they want to provide that opportunity for them to move up and in, in within the companies. Um, I'm seeing a lot more um, automation. I know uh, Pritam mentioned, mentioned that and robotics getting integrated in a lot of data collection um, and sort of uh, mirroring what, what uh, he mentioned about cybersecurity, I see that starting to become a priority in a lot of our companies who, <clears throat> excuse me, are integrating these advanced technologies. And that'll be a whole new area that we don't even know what it will look like just yet um, as, as companies start to embrace and have to embrace some of the, the new technology and, and advancements in Industry 4.0 um, mm -hmm. that, that are coming. Fascinating. That's that's amazing. So we're going to see a lot, a lot of blurring of, of the sectors um, towards different ends. And I think that'll probably be a theme. Mark, you, you mentioned that architecture is changing. So tell us a little bit about the direction that you, you see happening in the next decade. Sure. And, you know, the, the, the profession of architecture, many people still picture a black and white photograph of white men with white button down shirts with their sleeve rolled up hunched over drawing boards smoking you know a lot of people perceive our profession as as still being that but in fact we we are trying to solve problems that that you know folks of that generation could only imagine and so the skills that we are are, are looking for the other thing i want to add is that we're still you know we are, are regulated by by state accrediting boards. So the path to being an architect, to being licensed still follows that, you know, you have to go to an accredited school and you have to have, you know, you have to go through an internship uh, position where, uh, you know, you learn under a licensed architect. That, that isn't really changing, but because of the diversity of work that we do, we're seeing more and more folks come into our profession with strong skills in, in uh, visualization and 3D modeling, um, graphic design, the digital experience and programming, all of those things are now informing our work and we're a larger organization. So we're able to have divisions that, that focus on that kind of work and, and the pathways to those are quite different than architecture school. Um, but the, the, the biggest pathway where we're trying to make an impact is is changing the paradigm in students' minds about, about seeing, seeing themselves mirrored in the profession. I think that's one of the things that we're working very hard towards. Um, you know, we partner with schools that can in things like design challenges and sparking the imagination of young students to even aspire to, to this kind of profession. And, and we're working with several high schools now in diving into specialized programs where we work with teachers 
um, and work with, um, with students to spark knowledge of what architecture is. And if we can get some of those students to think about themselves as designers, architects, problem solvers, understand what the global problems are, make architecture relevant to those students and put them on the pathway, we think that we're succeeding that way. And in terms of where the jobs of the future are, I think it's gonna be integrating, taking data that we're, you know, we're using in our digital tools to you know, climate data and integrating those more into our designs more automatically. And, and that's sort of where we're driving the profession now. But I think in eight years, people who are proficient and, and, um, and can speak to ideas of the climate challenge, but also are technically proficient and can bring the data into building design, I think is where those, where those jobs are gonna go. But for us, you know, building that pipeline of passion in communities of students who, who haven't seen themselves in that and making it relevant, that's where we're really uh, pushing hard. Yeah, and that's that's the thrust of the the tone of this meeting today is is for ed educators and everyone to learn about what the opportunities are. Um, I want to talk more about building pipelines, um, but first I just want to give Sarah a chance to talk about in a little more detail than you have about where the jobs are going and in what direction they are going to head in. Yeah, so um, the the transition away from fossil fuels and towards more energy efficient usage of fossil fuels is massive. And I think, you know, people might be more familiar with what a solar installer is. You're imagining someone getting up on a roof, putting panels on a roof, uh, wiring the system, that's correct. Uh, wind turbine technicians, this is, I think, probably going to be one of the highest growth areas um, in the future, if we're talking about those middle school students where there's gonna be a lot of jobs also overlapping with manufacturing. Um, but you know, these wind turbines are larger than skyscrapers, some of these offshore turbines, and they're, it's gonna take a huge workforce to keep them running. Um, I think another high growth area is energy storage. So not only um, because well, I should say there's a couple of big reasons energy storage is going to grow. One, uh, to build resilience in our energy grid. So during really hot days to protect us from blackouts, we can uh, have small energy storage and batteries to rely on to reduce pressure on uh, the power plants. But also as we shift to more renewables, they don't run 100% of the time. So we have to have a way to store that energy. And it also you know, prepares us for the next hurricane or extreme weather event. Um, there's a big growing movement to build what we call resilience hubs, which are, you know, it might be a school, it might be a community center. It's somewhere that people could go during an emergency that could have solar plus storage. So we have a clean source of energy and batteries to make sure people have a safe place to go where they're always gonna have access to electricity. And then two other big high growth sectors I to think about are uh, transportation. So switching to electric vehicles, thinking about in a city, where are we going to put all of the infrastructure to charge these vehicles? Mm -hmm. And then even thinking about uh, broad like transportation equity, there's a, some projects going on now in New York where a partner of ours, Green City Force, they're working to train folks on how to build and repair e-bikes to help okay. folks who don't have access to a car get around the city in a, in a way that's independent and is not always 100% dependent on public transportation. So a lot of growth there. And then finally, um, high efficiency HVAC and energy efficiency. So switching over our old systems to what we call air source heat pumps. This is, there are lots of people retiring from heating, ventilation, and air conditioning for people who don't know what HVAC stands for. And there's going to be a huge need for this and for the building operation and maintenance folks who run these systems. So, you know, we're building all these new buildings, like we're talking about new architecture, new design. We need people who know how to operate them. They work differently than an old building. There are a lot of automated technology. So 
There's so many different career pathways. And the one other thing I could add is that not all of them require a four-year degree. A lot of these jobs, you can go to a community college, you can honestly just go to a training program, get your OSHA certification and start right away into a career path that you do have opportunity for growth. If you start out as a solar installer, you could move up to a crew chief, you could get additional training, become an electrician. There's a lot of opportunities and they do not all require you to go to a four-year school. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's going to be true of a lot of these um, professions that there are multiple pathways to enter and a lot of different opportunities to enter. And that, that was a question somebody asked in the, in the chat that I, I want to sort of pick up, um, you know, just what, what are the entry points and the skills that are required, right? So I'm not going to go around and ask you each individually, but I, I'll ask you just to say, like, what are the skills that you think uh, people need to be successful in your profession? Like, what are you, what are you, what are you looking for in an entry level? What, what, do, what do people need to do? Um, and so um, let's, let's just hear from any of you, because I think we're going to find a lot of alignment here. So I want to kind of hear, I'll start with, you know, I'll, anyone go first. Tell me what are the skills that, you, that, you, that you, you, young people are going to need? I'll, I'll start and I want to echo something that, that Pritam said, which is, um, you know, first and foremost, um, we, when we look at, at, at young architects, young designers coming into the firm, um, you know, we look for a certain level of, I mean, ar architecture in general, it's a, it's a demanding profession. Um, there's a, but there's a level of um, communication skills that are really, really important. Ar architecture and design is more about communication than anything else. And um, we, we, we often see students who come in with beautiful design work, but, but have a, a difficult time speaking about what drove them to their solutions and what drove them to, to, to certain aspects of their work or what they were interested in or what, you know, what got them out of, out of bed to work on the projects every day. And um, we think that people who can, because ultimately we're out there and we wanna drive our, our young architects to be the people who are the agents of change. And we wanna have them face to face with, with our clients. And, and so that's a hugely important part of our, our work besides design skills and besides digital skills, those, those sort of softer interpersonal skills where they can meet with one human, we're a human, we're a human to human. This is why, why you know, like our, our last two years have been so difficult for our profession and for our practitioners, because at the end of the day, we're a human to human profession. And going back and working on design is, it's almost, it's almost secondary. So that's to, to me. And, and even as we see increasing levels of digitalization and increasing demand for digital skills, we cannot forget the importance of passion and, and interpersonal skills. Communication, collaboration. Mm -hmm. All right. Michelle. Mark, I just that, yeah, yeah, just to echo Mark too, I think, um, you know, even if a, an individual in manufacturing, for example, isn't a client facing um, employee, um, they are going to be working part of a team. So that communication is important regardless, because um, they have to be able to communicate with their supervisors, with the engineers who maybe designed the parts, with um, the welders who are going to take it to the next step. So there's, there is definitely communication in, in all aspects of every career. I would, I would definitely say too, um, echoing that, that that is of an importance. Um, one of the, the biggest ones that we see in manufacturing is just that problem solving and critical thinking um, skills, which I think everybody also um, desires in a, in a future employee. Um, and just that, that drive to solve and not stop until they do and always want to improve upon what they're what they are working on is um, a quality that manufacturers really most every position is focused on precision and perfection and um, and so when you have somebody who comes across a problem where the part isn't running the right way or something isn't fitting we need some we need individuals who can stop and think and solve that problem um, to move it forward. Um, and that's going to help them be successful um, for sure. And um, one thing I, I say to everyone is just that desire to learn. Um, never stop learning. If you stop learning, you stop advancing. And 
um, for every student um, that I come in contact with. It's something that I talk a lot about and you know, you've finished a grade or you've graduated from whatever this is, um, you've completed um, a class. It doesn't mean that you no longer use that content. You're, you're done with trigonometry because now you're into algebra two or whatever. Everything compounds and you have to continue learning and utilizing the skills of the past and gaining new skills for the future. Um, and especially in the age that we live in, in all professions, um, technology is creeping in um, on, on everyone and the way to be successful is to keep on learning. And just to add to that, I think I always tell people that there's three required skills that it takes to be successful in insurance in general. I, I feel like I'm generalizing here. It's, it's, I call it the three Ds. It's desire, as you just talked about. You need to want to learn the information. You don't need to go to school to, there's no insurance school that I'm aware of. I mean, you can get a broker's license and that is a special degree, which takes like about three weeks or, you know, three months to get but you need drive, which is like actually want to do the work. I think a lot of folks, like I have seen a lot of our younger employees struggle to be like driven to work that extra mile, like that hard work, the, you know, the job isn't done. And so I've got to stay up till midnight tonight to get the deadline met. That's, that's what I consider drive. And then last thing is discipline. I think a lot of us are, you know, very disciplined in our approach and that's key to success so none of these require schooling it's just a function of embedding these characteristics can make you a very successful person in the industry and i know several very successful people in our industry who are not pedigreed from a degree standpoint but are pedigreed from these three uh criteria sarah you want to add stuff yeah i would just add you know we're in a Unique situation, we're a training organization, right? So we're a nonprofit, we're um, training folks for different energy career pathways. So when we talk to partner employers who are, we're hoping will hire folks who come through our training program and we ask them like, what are the things that you're looking for? What we often hear back is uh, similar to what everyone here has already mentioned. Um, teamwork, good listening skills, collaboration, ready to learn, um, you know, professionalism, being able to arrive on time every day. This is like hands down the most critical thing. And obviously if people are coming in and they have some experience, they have some, we do a lot of industry certifications like Building Performance Institute or OSHA. Those are, those are benefits, but there's a lot of on the job training that can happen when you have someone who is excited to work and showing up and like fully showing up. So if there's any way we can help our students with like those softer skills, I feel like that really is the most important thing at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck whenever I talk to people in industry, just how, how common and aligned this set of skills is, right? I don't think that anybody said anything this morning that you wouldn't disagree with for, for, your, for your sector. You might prioritize one over the other, but there's an incredible amount of alignment. Um, in terms of like general employability skills. I like that term better than soft skills because they're, they're important, they're, they're credibly important. And, you know, coupled with it, and I think you've said it, there are some technical skills that, that you know, that you're gonna need that, that back up what you can do as an individual um, and that prove that you have competence to be able to enter the field and do the thing that you, you hired to do and grow further. There's a question in the chat about, the, the sort of technical skills and how you enter. And the question is, do you absolutely have to go to college um, or are they alternate pathways? And I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I do wanna address that question head on. Um, and I, I can read it directly, but it's, is college still the only way to embark upon a successful career? What are the other paths more hands-on, especially for students who are not academically so um, what, what should students explore there? Yeah, I think I'll, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I think uh, manufacturing is a great one to, to sort of highlight because um, the entry level positions can be literally coming straight from high school with little to no skills um, in being trained um, on the job. There are training programs, for example, here in Pittsburgh, New Century Careers is a free machinist training program. Um, there's a, a training program also in New York City, um, Dura Workforce. So there's a lot of really great options all around, I'm sure the US as well, community colleges too. 
but um, going to college and getting a four-year degree isn't providing every person who graduates with a successful future because there are a variety of different ways to find success. And in manufacturing, that doesn't mean a four-year degree. Um, if you are an engineer or have a desire to be an engineer, there are all sorts of ways to become that title and earn that pay without going on for a four-year degree. Um, Pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships, apprenticeships um, and community colleges all offer a lot of opportunities for students who want that additional training. But like I said, entry level uh, and on-the-job training is also um, really valuable and um, very prolific in, 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 uh, in manufacturing. Great. So, Quitan. Yeah, the only point I would, you know, I, I feel like she, uh, you, you captured it really well, but the only point I'll make is that it depends what you want to do in the insurance industry or what you want to do in the cybersecurity space. And the only caveat I'm going to throw out there is I don't think a four-year college degree is necessary. However, there are certain times you will reach career plateaus in certain lines where further education may be necessary. So I want to be very eyes wide open to that. In the case of becoming an insurance broker, which is more on the people skills and the soft skills, um, that does not require a four-year degree and you can keep advancing and keep building your book of business. But there are certain areas within our industry that do require a little bit of education just because of the technical nature of the work. Yeah, but I, I would just add, Preetam, that you know, in, in the field of cyber and, and technical IT careers in general, there's a rich ecosystem of certifications that provide entry to, to entry-level jobs at least. And I agree with you that advancement is going to require more certifications or potentially a degree, but there are lots of on-ramps through boot camps or certification training programs, right? Yeah, there's, there's absolutely a fair number of certifications you can achieve. Um, and it really depends on the goals. Um, if you aspire to become a, a penetration tester, which is one of the very common lines of work within cybersecurity, a boot camp degree is excellent. It gets you all the skills you need. It's arguably more useful than a four-year degree where they don't teach you those skills in the first place. So it's more concentrated and shorter and gets you the skills to get on the job quickly. On the other hand, if you want to do data science or modeling, it's a different different equation. So I, I think it really depends on what the desired outcome is. Great, super. Um, Sarah, you, you, you offer training. Is, is college needed or, or what does the training provide? For the hands-on, most of the hands-on jobs in, that we train for, college is definitely not needed. We do provide, there's a lot of different, what I would call industry recognized certifications in energy efficiency, in HVAC, in solar. Um, and there are diff there's some that are more regional, like uh, certification. There's some certifications we offer that are most recognized just in New York City. There's some that are national um, and they can vary from anywhere from like a two week training to a four month training. Um, but they're all seen as really valuable um, for getting entry level positions, especially in the hands on uh, sectors. Great, I hope this is answering the question that the anonymous person provided. Mark, you talked about this earlier that you're regulated, you need a degree, um, but is there any entry pathway that doesn't require a degree, a way to get your foot in the door? Well, we're, we're, we're trying to pilot a program uh, in one of our offices around it, uh, an apprenticeship model. I mean, in a way that's a, and it's a throwback really to the way you know, architects got uh, got their licenses because you know there there weren't necessarily uh, a tremendous number of accredited programs out there, um, but you know it's still it's still a pilot. I do think that there are potential opportunities that are outside of the traditional kind of going in as a as a young architect role that perhaps um, degrees are not required. Um, you know we every architecture office is an ecosystem of multiple professions. So there are accounting teams, there are HR teams, there are um, digital design teams and graphic design teams. And all of those have their own specific pathways, many of which I think, you know, an associate's degree uh, or other type of training would be adequate. But for 
you know, for a designer's role right now, we're, we're a little bit behind the curve of where I, I think we want to be or where we should be, which is to develop that apprenticeship model to a point where there is a, there's a path for non-college degrees uh, and then a pathway to licensure through, um, you know, through the licensing process of each state. So we're a little bit, we're a little bit behind, but, um, you know, I have seen where students and, and individuals come in and they enter one pathway, a non-design pathway, uh, and find their way into a design pathway, either through going to school part-time. So that, that's kind of the way we, we grow the practice. But right now we're not, we're only starting to, to try to overcome that challenge. Yeah, but I wanna underscore how important that is in terms of the audience here who are educators thinking, not, not closing off any profession. Um, meaning that what I heard you say is that you, if this is the thing you wanna be, there are ways to get there and go to college later on. There's a way you can get started. There's a way you can learn some of the terminology and be in the field and enter the, the field of your dream while you're pursuing another one, which, you know, which brings me to a question that's underlying on, on everyone's mind around increasing the diversity of, of folks who work in the field, right? You mentioned, Michelle, we have the stereotype, and, and Mark too, you mentioned a stereotype of who works in the field. They're white, they're male. Um, how, what are you seeing in your, um, in your professions, promising practices that are adding some diversity, are targeting women, are finding ways for people of color to feel welcome in the field? Yeah, so I can um, speak from the manufacturing side real quickly. Um, a lot of an initiate, uh, initiatives happening nationally. Um, Women in Manufacturing is a large organization. Um, it's, it's fairly new to the scene. It's been around not quite 10 years. Um, and the Society of Women in Engineers is another large one um, that has been around for a very long time, both driven and focused on trying to get more young women and especially girls interested in that career pathway sooner. Um, Society of Women Engineers has what they call the NEXT um, NXT, um, program, and it is actually a STEM-based program for girls in the K-12 system to engage in experience engineering and hopefully spark that interest and, and encourage them to continue on in that pathway. Um, there's also the American Association of University Women. It's very focused on STEM careers and, and um, not just manufacturing, but all um, STEM fields um, that is doing a lot of um, great work nationally too. Um, in addition to their focus on women, they also have a focus on um, people of color and specifically women um, as of color. So um, a really great organization doing some some awesome things, raising awareness, but also um, helping to create policy changes and um, educate the employers as well. Um, there is Women in Technology, there's the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, so there's a lot of really uh, um, great organizations out there. Um, I really, I think there's probably one in every person on here um, in the presentations um, city or nearby where I would strongly recommend um, if you have an interest in trying to get your students um, who might be from a diverse background interested in some of these careers um, to reach out to um, your local chapters or local organizations um, to try and um, bring in speakers and, and create those um, opportunities for your students to get to experience um, the careers and, and the skills. Great. Sarah, any, any, anything to add on this? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that one major lever for this needed systemic change to make these growing career pathways more equitable is through policy. And I think that there are examples of good policies or policies that are on the pathway to making a positive impact in industry. So for example, with this you know, transition to renewable energy and the push for um, energy efficiency, uh, in New York State, there's um, a state agency called NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. And NYSERDA has a phenomenal on-the-job training financial incentive, where if a company is hiring from what they consider priority populations, folks who are coming from 
disadvantaged communities who are often people of color, who are low income, coming from a low income family. If they hire those folks, they get wage subsidies for the first six months of employment. So that's one example of something where we can actually use a policy or a change to create real change to incentivize companies to change the way their business as usual, right? Because we really need to make this happen on a big scale. I think another example of that um, is just thinking about when cities and states are investing in large scale changes to infrastructure, um, giving priority to companies that commit to hiring from the communities where they're doing the work. So for example, in New Jersey, there's a really cool, uh, through the NJ uh, BPU, there's a really cool community solar program where large solar companies are installing community solar, which is also very accessible to people in general. And they're giving priority to contractors who hire folks from the communities where they're doing the projects. So these are ways that we can actually start to see a big difference. And I hope that best practices will continue to be shared across cities and states so that more folks can make these changes. And then I think it's up to businesses and nonprofits and city and state and federal agencies to all be coming together in spaces like this to talk about um, how to make these changes and also to really step up to the table and in companies start to hire people and start to go visit schools and work with youth. All of these things are important steps. Yeah, huge. Preetam? I would say we're in the early days of seeing those changes being made in the insurance industry. Um, there are many stereotypes, I think, you know, like any other industry, there are stereotypes around our industry as well. Um, I attend this conference, which is the biggest one in cybersecurity called Net Diligence. They have a full day where the first day of the event, they actually have different programs like a women's lunch to encourage more um, females into the industry, allow them the opportunity to understand it. Um, I actually, um, I'm at a unique intersection between cyber insurance and also uh, cybersecurity itself. I'm attending RSA in a few weeks and RSA has a whole host of events in the cybersecurity space. I think the cybersecurity industry has done a phenomenal job of welcoming everyone in. I, um, they do an entire lunch for high school students from the area, a lot of uh, inner city schools that can come to meet cybersecurity professionals. I remember when I was I attended as a, as a RSA scholar in 2018 or 2019, the years kind of blend together, it might be 2017. Um, they hosted a whole lunch where they brought uh, students from every high school in the San Francisco area to a lunch, and they had the CEO of CrowdStrike, which is one of the largest companies in cybersecurity, probably a $60 billion market cap company. And he spent an entire lunch meeting all the students, walking around. So, so they, there are wonderful initiatives, I'd say, in the cybersecurity space. I'm really excited for what's next in uh, other industries, uh, you know, in the insurance space as well. Yeah, I think what's really gratifying to hear is just how welcoming the, the, the inside people who work in the field, people who work support work in the field, just how welcoming they are. And that there's all these wonderful things that are happening that are moving in a direction. And Mark, I know you had some ideas about teachers and what teachers could do to, to promote, you know, not just architecture, but I guess a, a slew of careers that are often untapped or hidden. Yeah, and, and, and um, you know, we're, we, we believe that it's actually, you know, that that improving the participation of young women and, and students of color can often start at the high school level and even below with, with the teachers and you know, developing we have a we have a, a pilot program in, in our office where we have been co-developing a curriculum with um, with a teacher in, in a in a local charter school where you know, we step in at, at a virtually at a biweekly basis, but it's really the teacher on a more weekly basis is tracking the assignments and and helping the students with you know the logistics of the of the work and and through that exposure, those teachers are actually gaining the the idea is that perhaps sometime in the future those teachers could actually teach that curriculum. Um, 
and we think it could become even a more like a make teaching more rewarding when they're when the day-to-day the -day things that they're teaching can be expanded with the participation of professionals and and we think that will allow this kind of program to scale so it's not just dependent on the volunteer time of the practitioners but that we can then uh, implant and create uh, passion within the teaching community as, as well and so this these are these are early days but we're seeing some we're seeing some success and we're seeing uh, students who weren't even thinking about architecture as a profession and uh, now starting to think about, hey, I, I want to be a designer. I want to be an architect. Maybe I'm going to think about applying to architecture school. So, so to us, that's sort of where we think we can, we want to dive down into middle schools and to high schools. That's great. And th that's a good segue for me to, um, to introduce and, and make sure that everyone on the audience knows here um, what work schools that can is doing in this field with uh, many of the partners that are on this panel today. Um, you know, I think all of us realize that building talent pipelines from high school is going to take a teacher and a teacher who can expose her students to what these fields are, just like you're doing today, so that young people can learn about what the, what the opportunities and career pathways are. But it's also about building some skills to make sure that they're ready for those jobs, whether those skills are the kind of technical skills that we alluded to today, or some of the more um, employability skills like communication, and problem solving and resilience that can be taught in school so people can be ready for them. But then it, there's also this field of like, how do I know I can belong? Can I, can I, is this for me? And building young people's social capital, giving them a chance to meet with people from industry so they can see that that could be me or that this industry is inviting and welcoming to me. And so, you know, that's a theory that I think that that's the way that schools can do this work. And what Schools That Can is doing next year is building a course or offering a course to schools called STEM Career Skills that would teach young people about, we are doing cybersecurity and energy and advanced manufacturing um, as examples of careers, as well as, as, as well as young people just learning some basic career readiness building blocks of how to search for jobs and how to put yourself forward when you come for a job. What is a resume, a cover letter? but doing a lab or a task that lets you know if that's something you're good at, if it's something you wanna do, if it's something you feel like you could pursue in the future. And then we do all the work, schools that can, of, of engaging with industry professionals, of bringing them into the classroom, of making sure that young people are, are prepared to ask them questions. And so, you know, what, what we're trying to do here is build capacity of schools to be able to offer advancement and, and information about these career pathways. Because we do recognize, as you said, Mark, the teachers often don't have the capacity or the tools to be able to talk about these careers. And so we'll provide the curriculum, in this case, with the, with the help of some of the partners here. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll support the teacher in delivering the curriculum. And so that students can build this career pathway so they can understand some of the skills. So I did want to make sure, and I'll put my, my um, information in the chat afterwards, that if you are a school person and you're interested in learning more about this course, you know, you should, you should let us know and we can, we can talk about how to bring that to your school. Um, well, that's the commercial break, but I wanted to, you know, we have a few more minutes left. And so um, I, I think um, I want to give each of you a chance to to say some final closing word about your, your sector and career pathways and opportunities for young people. So um, this is all, whatever you wanna say in closing to this audience. Uh, I'll, then, I'll, uh, Mark, go first, yes. Sure, no, I, I, I just, you know, the, the, over the past few years, as we've been working with students and teachers in high schools, we, our, our team has been amazed and inspired by the voices of these students and what they and what they bring to the conversation, how thoughtful they are, and we are excited and and really committed to the prospect of bringing more more students of more more female students and more students of color into our profession to learn to, because they bring a very very unique perspective 
Uh, and they don't, this is not just about diversifying our population, it's about diversifying the, the, the ideas and the thoughts that, um, that come into our world because we are trying to solve huge problems and we can't do it without these students and without the student voice. So, you know, if there are things that you can do in your organizations to educate students about what architecture is and how it's relevant to them, uh, we think the world will be a better place. And that's what we're ultimately what we're trying, what we're striving for. Beautiful. Thank you. We Tim. Yeah, I, uh, I know we're on a collaborative panel, but I'll do something a little non-collaborative here and I'll make a shameless appeal for why cyber insurance and the insurance industry is a great profession for students. Um, namely, I, I think a lot of industries, you come into an industry I, I, and I think of, about myself when I was 18 years old. I went to college thinking I was gonna become a chemical engineer. I thought I might become a doctor, a lawyer. I could have, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do when I was 18. And what I'll say is when you head down certain career paths, you get locked into them to an extent. There's only limited lateral mobility. I'd say the unique thing about the insurance industry and cybersecurity for that matter is that one day you could be um, in the back office being very technical you know, looking at code and like going blind with the green lines on the screen. The next, you can actually be a line underwriter using your technical skills and underwriting risk. The day after that, you can say, I want to speak to customers and actually handle brokers and customer relations. The industry, cybersecurity, because it's so evolving, allows for a tremendous amount of mobility around the industry, which I think that most professions don't offer students, especially younger students who are coming into something directly after high school, not being exposed to professional work and not knowing what they're signing up for. So that's my only, uh, only thing I'll throw out there is uh, it's a very flexible career and it's uh, compensation is also wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, for sure. Thank you for saying that. But you're not the only game in town. So there are lots of different opportunities there. But that is an important one. Thank you for letting us know that. Uh, Michelle, do you want to go next? Uh, closing word. Yeah. Um, so first, um, again, thank you, Julian and Schools at Can for having me here today to, to share a little bit. Um, as a former educator, um, I just want to say there is amazing things happening in the K-12 system. Um, there's a great curriculum being taught in the classrooms. Um, but what we we sometimes forget to do is just connect it to the careers. And so um, that's one thing that that I've really tried to um, help our school partners with is, um, you know, if you are a makerspace classroom or a math classroom or an English classroom, you're teaching the skills that industry is looking for. Let's just help connect the dots and show some career pathways that use those skills. Um, and it's hard for teachers um, a lot of times who maybe aren't aware. So um, kudos to everyone who's participating um, and joined today and, and will watch us in the future because um, it really is important for us as educators to um, help our students understand how they can take a passion or something that they enjoy from um, class and apply it to a, um, a career pathway. Um, and there's a lot of different ways um, similar uh, to all the careers here today that you can find success in manufacturing. And at the end of the day, we, we really need them. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for, for students to get into. It's, it's a career pathway that's not going away ever. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. And Sarah, you get the last word, 60 seconds or less. Yes. Uh, our students are very mad about the climate crisis and yeah. justifiably. and there are lots of careers that they can pursue that can help solve this massive global issue. And they're accessible at all different points and for all different um, interests and pathways. And one other resource I just wanna share quick for teachers is these solar, these career maps, a lot more uh, organizations and companies are launching these. They're interactive web tools where you can actually map out different salaries. And if you were to go in entry level where you could grow in that job and sector. So I highly suggest this as a resource for middle school and high school teachers. It's a tool you thank can you. use right away. Super helpful. And thank you to everyone on the panel. I learned a lot. This was great. Uh, all of these are great, rich opportunities. One isn't over the other. They're all there. There's lots of interest for everyone. So thank you for taking your time this morning and, uh, and, and being part of this panel.
on behalf of Schools of Can. And for those of you who are listening, come back at noon. We have another great panel at noon. So thank you all. Have a great day. Appreciate it.